We are in a series called Make Room, and for those of you that maybe hadn't been here or don't know what this is about, there is a newsletter in your outline. Please take time to read that. Um, I wrote some of it, so it's really awesome. And, uh, and so we want you to read that about Make Room. We are, we are planning on saying, hey, how can we make room for more here at New Branch Community Church? And one of the ways is this, is we're considering saying, hey, in the future, not right now, but in the future, do we need a new facility? And, and what is your part in that? And how do we raise money for that? And should we raise money for that? And we're answering all those questions. So we're not asking you to give. We're not saying, hey, hurry up and give. What we're asking you to do right now is this, just simply pray. And so for the last several weeks, we've been fasting and praying. We came together as a church yesterday and prayed. And uh, if you haven't been part of it yet, you still can be. And what we'd like you to do is this, is while you're praying, um, come to the meeting next Sunday night, okay? It's a dinner. We're going to provide dinner for you. Um, you can break your fast for that period of time and come together, and we're going to have a great time together, and we're going to share some things that have happened to New Branch over the last six years and project some things of where we want to go, and we want you to ask questions, and, th and then we're going we're gonna to explain, well, what could we commit to together over the next three years? And just so you know, it's not a high-pressure dinner. So maybe you've been to fundraising dinners where they don't let you leave until, until you give or something like that. And I, I told Kathy Richards today, I said, would you sing at this? And she said, if I did, everybody would leave. And I said, well, would you sing? And then we would say, hey, to stop her from singing, you know, <laughs> give more and we'll make it stop. Okay, But we're not going to do any of that. What we want you to do is, I'm just playing by, that, by the way. So, so <laughs> what we're going to do is this, is we want to just explain what God is doing, Okay and what we believe God is leading us to, and we want your input on it, and then we want you to take this home and pray over it. And whatever God's telling you to do, we want you to do that, and then we'll come back on November the 20th, and we're going to ask Commitment Sunday, and we're going to make our commitments that day. If you can't be here November 20th, we do have, you can mail it in, but we would like to get that so we can say, hey, here's, God is moving through the passion of his people, and are you willing to be part of this? Do you, do you think it's worth making room for more? And if you do, then, then let's talk about that and let's do it. And so that's really what the Make Room Project is all about. Please sign up for the dinner. We need to know how many's coming. We got a special night planned for the kids. So if you got children that are coming or grandkids that are coming or whatever, please let us know. And we want you to be part of it. And the dinner's going to be great. And we're going to have a great time together. So please be part of that. And, uh, and so we're in a series called Make Room. And today... What I want to talk about is this, is one of the things in my life that has helped change me the most about my relationship with God, and I want to be able to share that with you today, and it's this. How do you know what God is telling you to do? Have you ever had anybody ask you that? Because I've, I've had it, and sometimes I think because after you've been in faith for a while and you start to learn God's voice, you don't realize that some people are going, man, I pray, but I don't, I'm, I'm afraid. I don't really, I don't really understand what God is telling me to do. I don't understand how can I know what God's will is? How can I, how could I have that kind of quiet time? How could I have that kind of thing that goes on in my life where, where God actually speaks to me? And, and how could I hear his voice? And how does that work? And, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a little bit of how it works for me. And I want to share some scriptures with you about some principles found in scripture that might be able to help you with that. And you might be able to leave today going, you know, I was confused. And even about this make room to go, hey, how do I know what I should give? And today, I want, I want to show you a way that maybe you could pray, that you could actually hear God's voice, not only for this, but in your life. Not, not only for that, but the mission that God might have for you and, and how, how we're supposed to respond. I think, I think that could be powerful for some. So we've been taking a look at a parable found in Luke chapter 14, and we'll put that up here on the screen. Um, we're, today, we're just going to cover one verse of it because we've been covering it over the last several weeks. If you've missed any of the messages, newbranch.net is our website. And you can listen to all the messages right there, and all the Make Room stuff is there as well. And uh, so we've covered several things, but we're gonna look, we've are gonna we been looking at this parable through different lenses. And I highly recommend, take a look at Luke 14, it's an amazing story. So let me explain and set it up for you if you haven't been here, and maybe you have and you, you just didn't remember, um, is that what Jesus was doing was he was at a banquet with a lot of high-profile type people, religious leaders, politicians, and if you've ever been to those, anybody ever been to one of those? And, and it kind of makes you sick. <laughs> you know? And so you're there, and everybody is, is, is positioning themselves to go, hey, we're going to sit at the best seat at the table, and, and we're more important than other people because we have more money or we have more influence or whatever. And so everybody's jockeying for position. And Jesus sees it, and so he starts a dialogue that says, hey, you, know, you should give up your seat for somebody else. In fact, let them you know, stop self-promoting, let somebody else promote you, basically. And then he says, hey, not only that, but you know, this banquet would be a lot better if you had just invited the poor, because at least then 
you would get a gift in the kingdom of God. It would actually mean something instead of you just inviting your friends. And uh, they were getting kind of irritated with him. And so a person came along, and he basically was one of those that tried to divert the conversation. He's very political and very um, diplomatic. And so he came to Jesus, and he said, hey, let me ask you a question. What will it be like in the kingdom of God? Let's, let's start talking about end times. You ever seen a Christian do that? Where it's like, I don't want to talk about what's going on with me personally, I'd rather talk about some religious nuance, or I'd rather talk about end times and get off of what's going on with me. And Jesus said, oh yeah, no, I'll talk about, it. I'll talk about what happens in the end. In fact, it has to do with this, and I don't think the guy, the guy got more than what he was bargaining for. And so Jesus said, hey, let me tell you what it's like. It's like, a mass, it's like a, a, an owner of a house. It's like this person that wants to throw a huge banquet, like a wedding. And I know we've had several weddings this, this past season, so we understand. It takes a lot of effort to throw a wedding, doesn't it? And you, and you get RSVPs that come in, and, and those things are expensive. So you're going, man, I want you to come to my dinner. And it's like all the guests started making excuses for why they couldn't be here. <laughs> and, so, so, and, uh, and so the owner of the house, when, when, when after these people have RSVP'd, and now they're not going to show up, the people that were invited won't show up for the banquet, he gets angry, and he tells his servant, he says, hey, I want you to get up, and you go out and just invite the poor. Just let the poor come in. And the poor will just come in because they're, they're hungry and they, they, they'll come in because you don't have to do much to compel them to come in. They'll just come in. And then he says, hey, there's still room at my tables. I want my house to be full. And then the master right here, Luke 14, 23, he says, and the master told his servant, I want you to underline, circle a couple things because this is what we're going to talk about today. The master told his servant, circle the word servant, go, circle the word go, go out on the, the roads and the country lanes and compel, if you could circle the word compel, compel them to come in so that my house may be full. And then he goes on to say in verse 24, he says uh, that, that, um, that, that those that were invited won't get a taste of my meal because they didn't show up, they didn't bother, they don't care about their relationship. And, and if you wonder what the parable means, I really believe it means this, is that God is the, the person that's throwing the banquet, and it's a relationship with God that he's offering at this table, and it's bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, I invited you to come in, and you don't like what's on the table. Now, you're talking like you're religious, but, but you don't know me. You don't care about me. And it made him angry because, hey, man, the people that, that know, they have a head knowledge of God's word, but they don't want to know Jesus. They don't want to know God in that way. And so he tells the servant, hey, get up and go out. Now, we, now we, last week we covered why people make excuses for not sitting at the banquet table, okay? If you missed that, go back and listen to it. We talked about three things that, that are behind our excuses, that sometimes it's a hurt, sometimes it's a sin, sometimes it's too many priorities. That, that until you get over that, that, that what's behind the excuse, because a lot of times people make excuses, and then you can kind of feel it. When everybody's making excuses for all they can't come, you're like, something's behind that, and it is. And so you've got to kind of examine your life, because before we can get to this part, We've got to know that first part. So if you missed it, uh, part two, of which was last week, go back and listen to it. It's awesome. And then we realize that God is calling the servant to go out on the highways and the byways and the country roads to compel people to come in and sit at his table, meaning he wants a relationship with them. And as the church, we're his vehicle, that the Holy Spirit of God is the one that compels people to come in. But you know who he does it through? You know what the catalyst is that he uses? is the church. And that's really what I think this parable means is how many times have you heard that he said what? When he, before he left, he said, you know what I want you to do? Don't just go and congregate. Don't just go and be good. It's good to be good. It's good to follow all the rules. It's good to do all those things. It's good to follow all God's commands. But it's not enough. I want you to go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You get the idea? So he's, he's saying the same thing here. You get it? Go out and compel them. Go out on the, on the highways. Go out on 460. You get it? Go out in the country lanes. See, Zunai, you're mentioned. Just want to make sure you knew that. And uh, yeah, go out. Even, even Zunai, you get the idea? I don't know. Is there anybody here from Zunai today? Do y'all sit in a section? Do y'all want to move away from them now? I don't know if they just like come. Okay, you get it. We're segregated by Zunai, not. Okay, you get the idea. <laughs> That's funny. That's not, Alan, that's not deplorable, just so you know. I just want to throw that in there, okay? They're not deplorables. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry, i got to be political a little. It's funny. It's funny. All right. <laughs> so he said, go out and compel them to come in. They don't care. Hey, look, you're on the country road, no problem. You're in the city, no problem. It doesn't matter who you are. God wants them to come in, and it's our job. And here's the part that we have to see. And until we get past the excuses, we're not going to see this. 
That the church can easily become in, I don't like it that way, this is how I like it, I want it like this or that. And he's saying, no, 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 your job is to be the most compelling thing, not to be the banquet, to invite them to the banquet. You are the servant. See it? And the master tells us to do what? To go. Why do we want to make room? Because the master told us to. And this is really super important because if we're not careful, we'll say, well, this is what I want to do, and this is what I want to do, and we'll form committees. You ever been part of that? (laughs) And we're acting like we're the head of the church, or it's a dictatorship, right? The pastor wants to do it. The pastor wants to do that. Who cares, right? And we're going, I don't care what that guy wants, right? No, but it's the master. I'm not the master. I'm not the head of the table. The, the, the elders are not the head of the table. No person in this church is the head of the table. You're not the head of the table. God is. And yes, we want to sit out down at the banquet at the end of time. We want to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But he says, hey, work for the night is coming when no man can work. There is one more lost soul out there. Get up from the table and go out there in the highways and the byways and compel them. We are his servant. And yes, I know there's a connotation that means the Holy Spirit is the one drawing them. But guess what he left here to do? You know know who he left to do it? The church. That is our job. And when we say we don't want to do it, we're not following the Holy Spirit. And so today, here's what I want to tell you. What I want to to cover today is this, is how can you hear what the Holy Spirit is saying? This is important, isn't it? How do you know when it is? Because it's not just what we do, it's when we do it. And, and, And it reminded me to say, hey, let's take a look, because this is what I believe that God is calling us to do. But before we go here, You've got to know how to hear God's voice. And I've got to know how to hear God's voice. Because if I'm hearing my voice, or I'm saying, oh, I think that's a good idea, but I don't get what God's part is in this, you're going to miss it. And maybe you've missed it for a long time, and you never have known. And today might be the day when you could walk out the door and feel confident that you could hear what God is saying to you. Wouldn't that be something? What if he would speak directly to you? And I believe that he is, and now it's just a matter of how do we listen to that. And so today we're going to talk about it, and it may revolutionize your prayer life as it has mine. So I want to share with you something that that I learned from a class at Western Branch Community Church when I was there. Um, They had a class on evangelism, and I had been an associate pastor there and several other things. But one of the things I found was I had led some people to the Lord, but I always felt frustrated. Like I had done evangelism explosion and, and different things in the past. And what I learned was it was like, hey, I'm doing all the techniques But I'm sorry, people aren't just, just, I don't see anybody getting saved around me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I want to share the gospel, and then half the time it feels really creepy. You know, like I talk to somebody, and then when I share it, it's like, it just feels not good, you know? And and I'm following all the techniques, and and do you know if God will let you into heaven if you go? And why would God let you into heaven when you go? And all these things. And and it just didn't feel right. And, And when I took this class, there was one piece of the class that stood out. There was lots of things they taught. They taught, hey, really, all you gotta know is five Bible verses to share the gospel with somebody. That's what they taught. I was like, man, I could do a dissertation. In fact, I did, right? I mean, somebody sits down, and I'm ready to argue them into the kingdom. Can I tell you how many people came when I tried to argue them into the kingdom? Let me start back with a canon of scripture and prove it to you. And they were like, didn't care, (laughs) you know? And I was like, why don't you care about this? This is all this stuff I can tell you. I can can fact check you all the way into the kingdom of God. And they, "Mm -mm, nothing. And I I wasn't getting those kind of results. And and they said, hey, you know, you have to have the lifestyle to back it up. And I worked on that part. And And then the final piece, though, that changed my life was the day, this small prayer that they taught me has absolutely changed my life. And I want to share it with you, and hopefully it will do the same. It's not a mantra, but here's what I know. If if you do this, and here's what I want to tell you. If you do this, be careful, because it will change your life. You you might not think it at first, but if you sincerely pray this way, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, it will change your life. Okay? Is that amazing? Because it has me, and and I've been doing it for a number of years, and I have seen things that I can't even hardly believe as a result of praying this way. So here's the prayer, and it was done, and I put it in your outlines just to give credit where credit's due. The person that was teaching it, it wasn't from him. Jack Hayford wrote this down, and I just thought it was so incredible, and it was really about evangelism. But you know what I found about it? It applies to every area of our lives. Now, if you were in the discipleship class, you're going, I'm sorry, we've talked about this before. Yeah. And review doesn't hurt, okay? So it's okay. You, you may have heard this before, but maybe this is the first time you're really going to hear it. We, we've talked about this before in the church. So I don't want to make it sound like it's something new. But here's what I know. Some of us have heard it, but we've never actually done it. 
And when you pray this way, I'm telling you, if you do this, God's going to change our lives. So let me explain each part of this for you today. The first thing is this, is you come aside. If you want to hear the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and simply all we're talking about is this. If you have something you're going, God, I need help with this. Maybe it's, maybe it's trying to win a friend to Christ, and you're going, how does that work? What do I do? How, where do I start? And, and the first thing you do is this, is you recognize that you need God, and so the first thing you do is you come aside. That's the first thing you do in prayer. Now, in your outlines are some Bible verses, and, and I want to just cover one of them with you today. It's Matthew chapter 6. In verse 6, and here's what it says. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. If you want to know how to pray, Matthew chapter 6 is, is the model. Okay? Jesus teaches how to pray. He's on the Sermon on the Mount, and one of the pieces that he does is he spends an entire chapter there discussing how you pray. And right before this, you know what he says? He says, here's what you don't do. Don't go out and use a whole bunch of flowery words. Don't go out and say a whole bunch of mantras. Don't go out and just think, hey, I'm going to say this tagline or that tagline, and God will finally hear me. That's what he says. He said, because they think they'll be heard for their many babblings, and they won't. God is saying, you know what he's saying? Pray a real prayer. You know what? I don't need all those words. You know what I need? I need real I need you to get real with me. Stop saying all those stated prayers and all these things and and, and get rid of that and get a real language and be real with God for the first time, and then God will hear you. Stop doing it out in public. What he said is what? He said, if you really want to commune with God, stop getting out on the street corner and praying and get in your closet and pray. Get, get, Get alone with God. So that's really what we're talking about here. Come aside. Get away from all the distractions in your life. Now, how hard is that for some of us, right? If you're retired, maybe not as hard. Maybe it is. I don't know. It doesn't matter if you're retired or not. It depends on your lifestyle. But getting alone with God is not easy, is it? I mean, think about that throughout your day. When do you have time to get away? Now, you could do it one day, but what we're talking about is on a consistent basis, a prayer you can pray every day that will change your life, and you got to get alone with God. When can you do that, right? Maybe you got to wake up early. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's in the car. Maybe it's, I don't know where. Maybe you got to run to the bathroom. I've done that, right? You're at work, and you're like, I, need, I haven't prayed today. I need to do that. And you just go to the bathroom, and you're like, boy, you're in there a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but it doesn't take long to do. For the most part, it's not hard when you do this because you're going to think, hey, this is going to take forever. No, it's not. And if you pray this way, it doesn't take forever. But you get alone from all distractions. I'll tell you one way that's helped me the most, and I don't know if it would help you, but even when you're in a crowded room, you know, I can make phone calls. And you just pick up your phone. You get the idea? And, and you can talk to God. And by the way, he don't charge any extra. You don't have to be in a service area. If you're in Zuni, you, can, you might not have ever seen one of these. That's okay. But you know, it's, <laughs> Even if you don't have service out in Zuni, which a lot of you don't, I get it. You can hold up your phone and you can talk to God because he'll hear you. You get it? But, you know, this is for us. So holding up the phone, God doesn't need that. And I understand about getting on our knees and posture, but here's what God wants. He goes, all right, I, I love you to get on your knees. I love you to reverence me, but I would also like you to talk to me for real. How many of us talk on our phone? That's okay. You pick up your phone. You don't have to dial a number. He's already there. And you tell God what's going on. See, you come aside, right? I'm in a crowded room, and I just do this. God, I, I need you. Right? They don't know what you're saying. Whisper it a little bit. If you talk too loud, they're going to think you're crazy. Okay? So just don't do that. But, but you see what I'm saying? And if you pick up that phone, it gives you a moment to come aside with God. It's worth it. Trust me. This is going to change your life, I'm telling you. Number one, come aside. Number two, be assured. Now, this is, this is a very important piece of the puzzle, and, and you can very easily not do it. And what I do when I pray this way, I actually say the words, come aside, be assured. You want to know the number one thing about evangelism? It isn't you that's, it's not your idea. It's God's. It isn't you that wants to compel. It isn't us that wants to make room. It's God. That's why I wanted you to see the parable. He told the servant, get up and go out and compel them to come in. That's our job. That's God's mission. And if God wants you to do it, don't you think he's going to give you the power to do it? And when you start believing that, you see Satan's going, nah, you can't do it. Nope, God can't use you. But God told you to do it. All right? Didn't God say? Remember Satan does that? 
And, and, and so, so you come back with the word of God, and now you're empowered. Go and make disciples of all nations. He's empowered you to do that, and you be, you be honest with it. But here's what we see. We go, God, but I have witnessed, and I have done all these things, and I don't see anybody coming to you, and I think you need to hold on to this one promise. 2 Peter verse 3, verse 9, okay, chapter 3, verse 9. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Okay. Some of us are looking at him and we're going, that person isn't saved yet. I've been praying and I've been praying and, and I want to and I don't see this happening and I want my husband to come so bad or I want my, my children to come so bad or I want my parents to come so bad to the Lord and they haven't come yet and I think God is slow. I think he's, in another version it says slack. When, when I was in high school we used to have a word slacker. You know, you use that a lot. And, and remember, God is no, somebody made a, a paraphrase, you know, God is no slacker. God is, God is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient. If you want to circle something, circle that. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, I don't know how else you can read this. God's desire is for everyone to come to repentance. When, when Jesus died on the cross, you know what he said? If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. That's God wanting to do this. That's why I say be assured. When we talk about making room, when we talk about doing these things, hold on to these promises. When you wake up and you say, does God even want me to witness? Does God even want me to be part of this? Absolutely he does. He says, I don't want one person to not come to repentance. And he's left the church with the greatest mission of all time, which is to reach out to someone else. Come aside. Be assured God wants to do this. It's going to empower you. The third thing is this. This will be the hardest part of the equation because it has to do with, anyway, we'll talk about it. Strip away. Strip away. Strip away has to do with some of the stuff we talked about last week. And I think sometimes we end right there. We think, okay, we got it now. So we strip away what? We strip away our sin. We strip away our hurt. Remember we talked about that last week? Some people won't go out and do it. Some people can't serve God because you got a hurt and you're going, I would serve, but every time you go to serve, what, Satan pokes your hurt and now you can't serve, right? He whispers in your ear, really, you're going to serve? You can't do it. Remember those people hurt you. Remember those people rejected the gospel. Remember you tried that one time and they made fun of you. Remember they slammed the door in your face. You can't do that. You can't share the gospel. You can't help nobody. And then if he don't get you with your hurt, what's he get? Your sin. Oh, you're a sinner. You can't, and he keeps poking your sin. Get it? You can't be free. You'll never be free, right? Some of us have tried. Some of us, we're trying to live with one foot in the world and one foot with God and ain't working out too well. And, and, and then some of us are going, hey, we're one foot in the world and one foot with God, but we're trying, right? We're trying, but we keep falling back. And we're going, this time it's going to be different, but it's not different, is it? I mean, and so, so what do we find last week? Go back and listen to last week. Really important. We strip away. God, they don't hate you. God will give you another chance. God has put us in your life to help you. The church ain't here to point you out, right? It ain't about putting on the best mask. If we start in that stuff, I'm telling you, this church is going down. It, it, it would nothing if we're not real. If we don't start being real, it ain't going to work. And so from the top, from whoever here down, whatever roles of leadership or whatever you got, you got to have accountability because we're all sinners saved by God's grace. Is that right? So let's start there. <laughs> and then let's say, let's stop making excuses for where we're at and going, let's get the help we need. And God is saying, the only way we can do this is together. So let's be honest. And let's strip away this stuff. Hey, God, God can't use me with this. I got it. That's last week. Okay, go back and listen to that. But, but, but once we get that, then here's what we think. I'll run with it now. And this is the problem with our prayer life. We're going to run with it because we think we know what God needs to do in our lives. And we're anxious. And I can't tell you how many people to come. I'm so frantic about this person coming to the Lord. Please share the gospel and please do these things. And it's fine. All that is great. And I think God's given us his burden, which is awesome. And you're feeling God's burden. But the problem is, is we're running with God's burden, but we stop. That, that's where we don't need God no more because we got it. No, you don't. That's why we're not getting any results. Well, it's not about results. It's not. Let me tell you something. When God wants it done, there will be results. Now, the results are with God. You understand how this works? So you're not responsible for the results, nor do you cause them. So you can't take glory in it when it happens, and you can't not take glory in it when it doesn't happen. So this part right here is really, really important. You strip away everything holding you back from hearing God's voice because he knows what needs to be done. Strip away. Look at, look at the verse, 1 Peter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. Does anybody have anxiety? 
Let me say what Satan does with your anxiety, whatever's making you anxious. Satan is working overtime, isn't he? He's going, oh, you got it all the way up to here. You got your sin done. You got your hurt done. You got it. But now you got anxiety because you're looking at the future and going, there's no way we can do this. And I got to tell you, this Make Room Project, I've heard the anxiety coming out. I don't think we can do that. I don't know how we can do I don't know. I don't think we can do that. I don't know if we should do that, right? I don't know. We're, we're kind of small. I don't know if we can do that. We're, we're, our kids' rooms are not filled up, so I don't know. I don't, should we ask? Should we try to go further? Should we try to reach more? You feel it? Because we're starting with what we can do. And God is saying, strip away your anxiety. You've got to give me that. Before we, we start talking about, let's not start with what we can't do. Let's not start with the obstacles. Let's start with what we're supposed to do. And then let's let God tell us when and where and how. And the only way to do that is you strip away. God, I'm feeling so anxious. God, I'm feeling all these things. This is what strip away is, right? You've come aside. You're alone with God. You, you're assured God wants to do this. And now you're going, God, you want to do this, but i got to tell you, I'm seeing some obstacles. Yeah. And God's going, I got that. Give me that. Give me that anxiety. Give, give me that. And, and here's the other thing. Not just anxiety. You know what it is? It's stripping away our expectations of what God is going to do. This is huge. You see, because I have a plan that I would like God to accomplish. And here's been my problem. And here's what we think prayer is. And if you're not careful, this is how you're going to pray. God, here's my plan. Please bless it. Hmm? That sounds good. And by the way, we got a lot of people teaching it. If you, you can claim, you can name it and claim it. You can gab it and grab it. You can do all that. Because if you tack on in Jesus' name, he's going to do all that stuff. But they forgot what in Jesus' name means. It means what Jesus wants. <laughs> when you comply to him, when you pray this way and you can hear from God, but you can't do that as long as you have the expectation. But I know what's right. God, I know what you need to do today. See, this is what I do. God, I got a great plan. You know what? I don't know if you thought of this, God. Get it? It sounds silly, doesn't it? But it's true, right? And some of you guys are right there. And let me tell you something. You're praying, right? Why haven't you given me that job? Why haven't you given me that raise? Why don't you give me more building? Why don't you give me better people? Why don't you? And God is saying, because i got to plan right where you are. Oh, right? Strip away. I want my husband to be saved right now. But God is going, that's not my plan for today. You never bothered asking me, right? You never bothered praying to me about what it is that I desire. I want so-and-so in the White House. But that might not be God's plan. But that means there might be, there might be persecution for Christians. That might be God's plan. <laughs> Can I tell you when more people get saved? You're not going to like it. There's more people coming to faith in Christ in China than there are in the United States because they're what? They're persecuted. Now, I'm not praying for persecution. But I am praying for people to be saved, so be careful how you pray. You get the idea? <laughs> Come aside, be assured, strip away what we think God is going to do and what, how we think God's going to do it. Stop telling God how to do his plan. Stop telling God what his plan is. You see, what we got to understand is this. It's as though, and, and I think this is the best illustration that I've heard, and it helped me so much when I understood it, and it changed my life, that God is the conductor of an orchestra, and we are the orchestra. And, and what I know is this, is that you can play really great, but if you play really great at the wrong time, it's really horrible. Can I say that again? You can play really great, but if you play great at the wrong time, it's absolutely horrible, and no one will know how great you are. And the louder you try to play, the worse it is, right? And the conductor's going, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Why are you doing that? That's not the note I need right now, but it's a good note, yep. It's the right thing. Yes, it is. See? But you're not following the conductor because he knows the song, right? And he's going, play your part. Okay, let's do it again. <laughs> play your part. Because you know it's going to sound horrible when it's not in the harmonics of everyone else. Now, if you, if you don't believe that, that's what God is doing. And what he's doing is he's waving his hands, and he's going, here's how I want you to follow. You come aside, you be assured, you strip away, play your part now. I don't want to play my part now. I don't understand my part. Can I say something? You don't need to understand your part. You just need to do your part. You just need to play your, hit that note when he says, that don't make sense to me. Well, I'm sorry. Can I, can I ask you to read the book of Job? I spent some time there because I really didn't understand God's plan for my life. And you know what I got at the end of the book of Job? He is not going to explain everything to you. 
He is the conductor. You are not. And the day he asks you for permission, I don't think you understand who is the master of the table. Get it? You go and you go and compel them to come in. That's not what I want to do. I want to, I want to cater to church people. They don't like that. They like a different kind of music. They like a different style of worship. They like a different, I don't care. God wants you to compel. He said, well, I didn't change my mission because of you. Like Henry Blackaby said it best. He said, he said, it is not, he said, we don't go to God and tell him how to do his work. We, we are supposed to hear from God, and, and we, we conform ourselves to his plan and his way of doing it. And when you do that, you're going to be on fire. Because what you're going to understand is you don't have to understand who to talk to. You don't have to understand anything. What you have to do is pray this way, and as you strip away, here's what's going to happen. God, you're going to hear God's voice, but you can't hear it with all your expectations. So, so what? Your, the distractions in life? Absolutely, come aside. Be assured God wants to do this. That gives you power to know this is what God's plan is. And then... Strip away. Because why? Because the thing that's keeping you from hearing God's voice the most, you're not going to like it any more than I do, is you. It's your voice keeping you from hearing God's voice. God, this is what I want. And he's going, I want you to get in flow with what I'm doing. I may very well do that, but I'm not doing it in your time, and you're doing it in mine. And if you understood the tapestry, see, what you're not missing is, is there's more players than just you. That's why the evangelism works when it's done in concert with God. But when we pick up our bullhorn and go, I'm the only voice, and I've got the message, and you've got to listen to me, it, it, rings, it, doesn't ring, it doesn't ring, does it? Nobody's getting saved. Nobody's doing anything. But when you're following God, let me tell you something. You have no idea what he's about to do. See? Come aside. Be assured. Strip away. The final thing is this. Be filled. This is the part that can be scary for people, especially if they don't understand the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's not a force. He's not something you get more of. <laughs> you can have more of him if you understand what we're talking about with him. He's a person. He's a person. So think of him like a person. You, know, you, don't, you don't get more of him in the sense of you're pouring in and it's like a liquid. He's not a liquid. He's a person. You, you get more of him as it is in relationship. You ever been that with your wife? You can be right beside her. But, but, but if you're arguing, you can be a million miles apart. <laughs> Get the picture? It isn't where is God. God is everywhere. It's how you are in relationship to God, and it's how you are in empowering him. And the word filled means empowerment. In another place it says don't be filled with wine, which leads to debauchery. That, if you wonder what wine does, debauchery, sound, it does exactly what it sounds like. Okay. <laughs> Anybody need an explanation or Want to give a personal example? Okay, you get the idea. So, so don't be filled with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled. It doesn't mean, intox it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean intoxicated like you're acting like a crazy person. It means, it means being empowered by it. The same way you're empowered by wine, you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. How is that? Because you give the control over to him. That's what being filled is. That's why all this other stuff has to be in place before you can do it. you got to come aside because you can't hear him when all these distractions. you, you got to be assured because you, your faith will wane when you go, it's based on me, and I don't know for sure that's what he said, but you stand on his promises, and then you strip away so that nothing, including yourself, is getting in the way of what God wants to say, and then you're filled, you're empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what he's calling you to do. Now let me explain how that works. Acts chapter 4 is a great study for you. And let me just read what it says. This is a pattern to follow, and I'm going to ask you to circle a couple things. Acts chapter 4 and verse 31. After they prayed, can you circle the word prayed? The place where they were meeting was what? Shaken, circle that. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, circle that whole thing. And then they spoke the word of God boldly, circle that. Prayed, shaken, filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke the word of God boldly. That's the pattern of the New Testament. You will see this pattern all throughout the book of Acts from the day of Pentecost on. Now, let me explain who these were. These were the apostles. And when the church leapt onto the scene after the day of Pentecost, let me tell you what happened on the day of Pentecost. They waited for the power of the Holy Spirit because they realized we can't do this without God's power. He said, wait, and I will send you. I will send you the power of the Holy Spirit. And he comes to them, and they had the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. And what happens? They waited and they prayed, right? The place where they were meeting was literally shaken. You read in Acts chapter 2, it's the same account. The place where they were meeting was shaken, and it says the Holy Spirit came down like tongues of fire on them. And then what did they do? After they prayed, they, they, the place was shaken. They were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. They went out and they, preached, they spoke the word of God boldly. Peter preached, and 3,000 people got saved and baptized that day. That's power. 
That's what the Holy Spirit can do. If you miss any one of those components, you're going to stop clear of going, oh, he shakes the place, and I'm filled, and now it's just about me. No, it isn't. It's about being able to speak the word of God. It's about being able to compel them to come in. You see? If you miss that, then you're going to think it's all about you, and then it's all about how we can arrange for you to be shaken, and you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, and you're just trying to have an experience. But the experience leads to your hands moving to do the one thing we can't do in heaven, which is to win the loss while there's still time. But you can't do it without this. See, there's a wrong time to share the gospel. Can I tell you when it is? When you're not being prompted by the Holy Spirit. Because the problem with that is this. We think it's about knowledge, and he's going, no knowledge is going to help them. They have no eyes. They have no ears. It takes him to draw them and open them up and draw them in. And he's going, I know when that timing is, so I will tell you when. And when that happens... It'll feel like magic, but it's not magic. It's God. See? Come aside, be assured, be filled. But why do I say Acts chapter? So what happened in Acts chapter 4? It's the same people. Why do they need to be filled again? You see, sometimes we think you're filled once and that's it. Did they, did they lose the Holy Spirit? No. But they needed to be filled again. Why? They needed to be empowered again. You know why? Because here's what happened to them in Acts chapter 4. They had been preaching the gospel and now there's almost 5,000 Christians running around. And, and the church, the, 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 the Pharisees were starting to go, oh my goodness, this, these crazy people that are following Jesus, these fishermen that are it, basically idiots is what they called them. They said, they're, they're leading a movement and we got to stop this thing. So let's nip this in the bud. They came in and they did what people do when people are doing something you don't like. They threatened them. They said, look, if you don't stop, we're going to hurt you. If you don't stop, we're going to kill you. You get it? And they left there that day and they were praising God because they understood that God inhabits the praises of his people. You read it in Acts chapter 4. They left feeling good about the fact that they were willing to be suffer for the cause of Christ. That's what it says. But let me tell you what I think they understood. And this is what I think is so awesome about them. They came together at the place and they prayed. You know what I think they prayed for? God, don't let that fear rule me. See, I'm no longer a slave. We sang that yesterday. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. And they knew we're human beings, and that fear is going to get into us. And they prayed together. And you know what happened? The place was literally shaken. And the power of the Holy Spirit filled them again. That with that fear that might have held them back from being able to be empowered, left. And the Holy Spirit filled them. And guess what they did? They went out and preached the word of God even more boldly, and thousands of more people got saved in their lifetime. By the way, they, they spread the gospel all throughout the Roman Empire in their lifetime. <laughs> it didn't stop them. But, but the story of the book of Acts is, and the next time, you know what they did? They, 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 something else happened to them. You know what they did? They prayed, and the place was shaken, and they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. Can I tell you something? You can pray this way every day, and you didn't even know it. And let, let me tell you how it works practically, because I think maybe that's where it probably loses it. So as I started to pray this way, let me tell you how it worked for me, and I, don't, I can't tell you what it will do for you. But every morning I wake up, and, and if I went to work and I forgot, then and I would go to the bathroom, and I'd say, Lord, I come aside. God, I believe that you want me to do your, your work. I, want you, I believe you want me to do something. I, I believe that you want to evangelize. I believe you want people to get saved. I strip away who you want me to talk to. I know who I want to talk to, but I don't know if that's who you want me to talk to. Who do you want me to talk to? What do you want me to do? And then be filled. Now, it was all awesome all the way up until I got to be filled. And I'd say, I want to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Nothing. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'm doing this wrong, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm just not touched like some people, and they get all this experience and all this. And I didn't have any of that. But what I had was this. I got up from there, and I was like, I don't think that did anything. And then as I got in my car, or I started walking back to my office, all of a sudden, throughout the day, I would go, I'd see something, and it was though something inside of me was saying, you need to, you need to go talk to that person. You know what you need to do? You need to go ask that person if you can pray for them. You know what, that homeless person on the side of the road, you need to stop for them. And, and it was an internal fight. <laughs> this is how I know it wasn't my voice. Because the internal fight was, I'm sorry, that person's going to think I'm a nut. Right? I mean, what are you talking about? Go talk to somebody out of the blue. I'm like, what? And, and, and so after a while, you're going, it's this nagging, and you're like, I can't get away from it. I just can't stop. And, and you go all the way to work, and then you go all the way back, and you go to the homeless person, and you go, hey, I, you know, can I help you? Can I get you something to eat? Can I do whatever? Sometimes it, it, you'd fall flat. And what you're understanding is God is the orchestrator doesn't matter. They reject the gospel. Okay. 
I didn't do it for anything. I did it for God, and I don't know how he's going to use that. And I'm one link in the chain, and the day you understand that is the day you understand the results aren't just about you and you seeing the results. It's about saying some water, some plant, but God gives and God makes it grow. You get the picture? And when you embrace that, I'm telling you, your life will start to change. And what you're going to see is this. See, you're going to think that I'm talking about something spooky as though it's not happening all the time. God is constantly talking. We just can't hear him. And he's opening the eyes of your heart to the needs around you, not just the needs of all the world, but the needs in your world. And he's going, play your part now. And the day, let me tell you when it changed my life, was the day that I went up to one person, and all of a sudden they said, I can't believe you asked, because I thought about killing myself today. I, I can't believe when I pray for somebody, I walk up, and all of a sudden my boss says, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Because I watched this documentary last night. I'm not making this stuff up, and I went what? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't understand what you just said. Did he come to faith in Christ? Not that day, but we had a conversation about Christ at the workplace. This guy was from Iran. I mean, how do you make this stuff up? You know what I'm saying? I'm telling you, when you pray this way, God will open the eyes of your heart, and it takes all the pressure off, because all you have to do is follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit of God. Does that make sense? Pray this way. It will change your life. God wants to be part. It's not spooky. It's not scary. God works through a still, small voice if we listen. He's always speaking. We're just not listening. And if you pray that way, when you're driving down the road, just be aware. You're going to have to get involved. Because the Holy Spirit's going to tell you, one day it was my grandma. My grandma since went home to be with the Lord. Um, but she was not the easiest person in the world. And one day he said, you need to call your grandma. I'm sorry, I want to minister to a lot of people, not my grandma. Okay? <laughs> so, so, but I called her, and that day she needed it. You see what I'm saying? Somehow he does that. And what you learn is, is as you go, you learn to just start following the promptings versus arguing with the promptings because you, you're going to have to go back and do it. You know, you want to drive all the work and not stop, you, that's your choice. But I'm telling you, God will do it. And not only will he do it through evangelism, he'll do it in every area of your life. How about your mortgage? How about your bills? How about your job? How about whatever it is? And stop pushing. This is, this is the word that I got from the Lord, even for my own life, because I'm a pusher. I don't know if any of y'all know that, but I'm, I'm very pushy. <laughs> I'm a pushy person. That's what I've learned about life. If you want to do something, you, sometimes you just have to kick the door down. You know, That's what I've learned. But you know what God's teaching me? Stop. You know what I need you to do, John? I, don't need, you to, I need you to stop pushing and start flowing with the Holy Spirit. Get it? Because you're messing up all the harmonics. You see, you got all these expectations of how it's supposed to be. Even with this Make Room project. You know what my expectations are? Whatever God lays on your heart to do. <laughs> are you going to be disappointed, John? I can't be. <laughs> I can't possibly be disappointed when it's in God's hands. Because whatever God lays on our hearts to do, that's what it's going to be. Get it? And so here's what I know. If you have those expectations, you can trust God, believe me. And God is going to move in such a powerful way. Let me tell you something. I never thought this church could be a possibility, and here it is. Come aside, be assured, strip away, be filled. And I'm telling you, God will change everything. It, this, this will be the most powerful thing. And what happens is, is you, you might not understand, but when you're part of that, with what God is doing, and you're flowing with that, and you're starting to see changes, and you're seeing people, and they're going, man, I can't believe that happened. You're going to be, it's going to blow your mind what God can do with your life. It's absolutely awesome. It takes all the pressure off. It puts all the power on you, and I'm telling you, you don't have to worry about what anybody else is asking you. You don't have to feel pressure. You know what to say yes to and what to say no to when you seek God. He says, knock, and the door will be open. He says, look, seek me, and you will find me. Some of us aren't listening. We think we know better. Do it, and I tell you, it'll do that. So, so here's what I want to challenge you with. Will you commit to doing one thing this week? Not, not to giving. What I want you to do is I want you to pray. What is God calling you to do to make room? Is it, maybe it's serving. Maybe it's calling a person. Maybe it's praying this way every day. I don't know what God's calling you to do. And one last thing is this. Would you sign up on this orange card and figure out how we could do this together? Because here's what I know. God works in the harmonics. You see, when the power of the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, you know what he was waiting for? They weren't waiting on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was waiting on them. And he said, I want you to sit there for 10 days, and I want you to pray, and then I'll show up. 
They didn't know what to do until he did. And what I'm praying for this meeting is this, that the Holy Spirit will show up. Get it? That we will come together and the harmonics of that, because the Holy Spirit comes when they're in unity. And Jesus understood. You go back to last week's message, John chapter 17, we talked a little bit about it. And the last thing Jesus prayed for, you know what he prayed for before going to the cross? He said, I could pray for a lot of things, and I'm praying for a lot of things. But he prayed for us, not just his apostles. He said, those that come after them. And he said, make them one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, so that the world may know that you have sent me. <laughs> you getting it? The world's never going to know until we come together. Can we make room? We make room for the power of the Holy Spirit first. <laughs> and then let me tell you something. We'll never build a building big enough to, to hold what it is that he wants to do. <laughs> Does that make sense? Please come. Please pray. I and mean, God is going to do some amazing things. Let's stand for prayer.